speaking of Texas, um, how was that territory defined boundary-wise? Because, you know, you had the Blanchard and San Antonio and stuff. So, uh, specific to Fritz, uh, what was the Dallas See, territory? There's a, there's a big misconception on that. Paul Bosch had one town. Joe Blanchard had two towns. They had no talent. The booking office controlled the talent, so therefore we controlled the promoters. We had anywhere between 16 and 18 guys in our booking office in Dallas while I was the booker. I didn't want to keep more than that because I, if I had 20, 22, some guys would be off. Right. And I tried to keep it anywhere between six, 14 and 16 guys. Now, without the Dallas booking office, Joe Blanchard, where could he get his talent? Would he fly everyone in from Bill Watts? Would he fly everyone in from Vince? Right. The same thing with Paul Bice. So that's a misconception that it was Dallas was just a little place here, then Paul and Joe were separate. They weren't. Without the talent from the Dallas booking office, they had no talent. Mm -hmm. if, if I would say to Joe one day, look, Joe, uh, we're no longer interested in booking your town because it's not profitable for us. Where would Joe go? Would mm -hmm. he go to L.A. to Mike LaBelle and fly in 12 guys? Would he go to Bill Watts and fly in 12 of Bill's guys? And do you think that Bill would allow them to use his talent anywhere, any way they wanted to? That mm -hmm. was my big problem. Two big problems in Texas in the booking office. Paul Bysh like to use world's champions. He didn't care if it was AWA, WWE, or NWA. And that was constant problems for me as the matchmaker mm -hmm. because I was a matchmaker for the National Wrestling Alliance. And every time he'd bring in Bruno or he'd bring in Nick Bockwinkle, I would catch hell from half the alliance. Gary, you got to stop doing this. But I was under a situation where I was booking Paul's towns and he was paying us 40% of the gross. The same thing with Joe Blanchard. So I had to allow them the freedom to bring people in occasionally. Mm -hmm. But it's a misconception that Joe had a separate territory and Paul had a separate territory. No, Paul did not have any wrestlers that he employed. Huh. Joe Blanchard had no wrestlers he employed. All the wrestlers, if you wanted to come and wrestle in Texas, you called the Dallas booking office, you talked to Danny Pletches before me and Red Bastine before me, but as of uh, 1976 until 1982, I was the guy. If you were going to come to Texas and work for Paul mm -hmm. or Joe, you came through me. That's interesting. If I, I didn't want to use you, then Paul didn't have a chance to use you. But it's a big misconception, like it was three little, little different territories. It wasn't. Right. There was Houston. Right. San Antonio, Corpus, Dallas, Fort Worth, and in spot shows. But every piece of talent, the bulk of the card came from my office, and I ran the show. I did what I wanted mm -hmm. to do, because you got to remember, I had to keep my talent happy mm -hmm. or they would leave. So I couldn't allow Joe Blanchard nor Paul Weiss mm -hmm. to just use my talent any way I could. Sure, you of course. just can't do that. And that is a big misconception. Another thing people don't understand, not only did we have Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, Corpus Christi, and Houston, we had Amarillo, we had Lubbock, we had Abilene, we had San Angelo, we had El Paso, we had Lawton, Oklahoma. We, we had about 32 towns. But, you know, revisionist history yeah. goes around. And uh, most of the things that you hear about world class is not necessarily true. There was one power in Texas that was Fritz von Erich and who his booker was. Paul could not live without him. Joe could not live without him. A fact. Joe broke away in 79. He died a horrible death. Paul Bosch, one of the greatest promoters ever in wrestling, broke away in 79. He went a couple of years with Bill Watts, couldn't get along with Bill Watts. He went with Joe Blanchard, couldn't get along with Joe Blanchard. Mm. He went with Vince McMahon, he couldn't get along with Vince McMahon. So by 1982, in two years after running a successful promotion for over 30 years, without the talent and the direction of the Dallas booking office, not only did Joe Blanchard go out of business, Paul Bysh went out of business. Mm. So that is a bit of history that is factual but not really mentioned. Joe Blanchard was the first guy that had USA TV, long before Vince. And he blew it. Yeah. 
he lost the TV. Yeah. So, I mean, a lot of this thing about Texas and Paul and Joe, and it was separate but equal, that's not Yeah, true. I mean, that's that's just what you hear. Every, you know, every city gets a stamp. You know, Dallas, yeah. the, the Dallas office, uh, the, the yeah. San Antonio, Houston, yeah, but they separate were, territories. Yeah, but this but is very Dallas was the booking office. Right, sure. Yeah, I understand. And no one, you could not work in San Antonio or Houston unless you worked for the booking office out of Dallas. Right. Now, say you're Nick Bockwinkle. Paul could bring you in, we allowed that. Say if you're Bruno Sermatino, Dusty Rhodes, Ivan Koloff, we would allow that, one or two, to keep him happy. Mm -hmm. But you gotta remember, every time these two guys would bring someone in, it would mean knock one of my boys out of a night's work. Right. People don't remember that, they just remember, well, yeah, Paul was this and Paul, and Paul was a great promoter. Mm -hmm. Joe Blanchard was shits. <laughs> He had no idea, no concept of anything. His greatest fame was he was a commentator for Jim Barnett when he was Jim's TV uh, announcer. Right. And Joe would have never had that position in Florida, in, in Texas, in San Antonio. Fritz von Erich put him in there because Fritz and Joe were buddies. Oh. I was in the meeting the day that Fritz von Erich told Dorothy Brown and Frank Livingood, meet your new partner, Joe Blanchard, and they bought. We don't need a new partner. Well, he's your partner. ECW was built on the the hardcore style and, and some of the stuff that uh, that traditional wrestling fans were cringing at at the time. Um, here we are, 2006, uh, 12 years later after the fact. What do we do with that? Do we keep that hardcore style? Are you going to scale it back? You've got TV now. You've got cable network TV, so that's something you need to be concerned about. How would you handle that? Would you update the style? Uh, would you keep it only violent at the house shows? Or how, how would you handle it? Um, I mean, you definitely have to have the hardcore style. You're extreme championship wrestling, so you have the extreme name. You have to live up to that. So I would keep that, but it would be scaled back from what the original ECW was. Um, you would want to keep rules in a lot of the matches and make the hardcore stand out, but the hardcore style would definitely be something that you would emphasize. Okay. And because, uh, you, you know, you're going to be dealing with advertisers now for television and stuff. So yeah. That's a, that's a fine line you'll have to walk. This, uh, the, the style of the show, the, the look of the show, the kind of cutty, choppy, uh, music video-ish kind of editing uh, that it had back in 95 and, 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 and that era. Do you keep that? What do you tell Kevin Dunn in the truck? How are we going to shoot this? Um, that's a good question. That would be, um, I mean, the video style of ECW was pretty hip in 95 and 96 and 97. I don't think it would be so hip now. Right. Um, I did like the way that they had the building lit when they started ECW and they shot it differently. I mean, now you're talking about are they going to let you have your own tapings or are they going to tell you that you have to tape after SmackDown and that's not really well, a that's choice. That's a good point. Well, right there, what would you do there? You'd probably I mean, prefer to do your own. Yeah, I mean, obviously you would prefer to do the smaller tapings and then you could do a lot more interesting stuff. If you have to go live after SmackDown, which that's really not the booker's decision, then you'd have to right. do basically what they did. Right. So a lot of that depends on that. But um, yeah, I mean, as far as things go, I, you would definitely prefer to tape it in, smaller, in a smaller setting. W would it be a big production with the pyro and the, and the ramp? Uh, what would you do to, to the physical look of the arena, other you had mentioned the lighting uh, that, that you admired when they brought it back, but what would you do with the physical look as far as pyro, lighting effects, uh, special lighting effects. I would lighting. try to make it as different as possible from Raw and SmackDown, so you'd probably leave the pyro out. I mean, you already have two, four hours of TV, two shows a week uh, with the pyro and the Titantron and all that other stuff, so you need to make this product stand out. Now, granted, you know, that's not the sexiest thing for the mm -hmm. casual viewer, but at the same time, um, you know, you're not looking to draw Raw's entire audience with this. You know, no one in that company is expecting that to happen. Right. So you definitely want to give it a different look. So I would, you, you want to have a sharp look. I mean, obviously you're producing a TV show that's going to national TV, mm -hmm. so it's got to have a good look to it. But as far as, like, the real explosive stuff and the pyro and all that, you probably want to scale that down. And In fact, I would prefer not to have any pyro at all. Okay. Uh, one of the things ECW is, is remembered most fondly for uh, was how they kind of unleashed uh, the, their uh, characters. I hate that damn word, but um, uh, the guys and the girls doing their own vignettes. Um, everything's scripted today, as we know, but, but um, so the vignettes were very important uh, and it helped sell that product and make it so unique. Would you continue to do 
that oh, yeah. stuff. I mean, vignettes have always been a big part of wrestling. I mean, yeah. going back to World Class, Mid-South, I mean, NWA, everybody did them back in the day. So you definitely need those, especially if you're going nationwide to a mass audience. I mean, in ROH, you know, we're, we're selling work rates, so it's not something that I have to deal with as much, although we still have them. Mm-hmm. But ECW, where you're going to the masses and it's, it's nationwide, yeah. then you definitely need vignettes and stuff to build the characters. How scripted? I don't believe in scripting them at all. I believe in bullet points and let the guy get himself over. I'm not Good. a fan of scripting at all. Good. Yes. I, I mean, back in the day, you know, no one scripted out for Dusty Rhodes or Ric Flair. They said, here, here's the match. Go sell it. And Yeah, it's, it's odd, um, and I, I guess this is a different take, but uh, why, why the emphasis is on today is, uh, is on scripting things so so intensely I guess that's when you might get into the ego of the writers you know yeah. I mean you never know I just I don't understand it myself so uh, music was also a very big part of easy to popular music yeah um, Vince doesn't touch that uh, everything is, is created in-house so it's owned in-house and he never has to worry about uh, having to pay a royalty ever to anyone <laughs> um, so what do you do? Does does Sandman come down to enter Sandman, or you have uh, to have I somebody mean, write a, a little? Uh... Nah, I'd say, hey Vince, you got a lot of money. Let's just pay for enter Sandman. I mean, if you have the the wealth behind you that WWE has, I would try to get all that original music again, especially enter Sandman. I mean, to me, if if he did have enter Sandman, he would have been a lot more over than coming out to that generic music that he I was agree. coming out mm-hmm. to. So yeah, I mean, he definitely would make a push for that. was to take uh, production values and elevated, uh, elevated everything. And the one big thing that, that I have to give him credit for that others didn't was uh, uh, attention to detail. Uh, things like uh, curtaining off empty seats. And that would seem to be not that big a deal. But every time I watch one of these fight telecasts or something and you you, you get a, a beauty shot from the back, the light somehow, like neon signs, reflects off those empty seats. And it, it just, it sends a subtle message that this is not that big a deal because you got people sitting out there amongst a multitude of empty seats. Yeah. And the, the thing that Vince used to do was he wanted it to, the presentation to be an event. All seats gave the appearance of being filled. I might have even read it in your book where, for posters, the uh, the marketing people would actually cut and paste and fill in empty seats in the background. That's true. And if you think about it, even in a, a red hot sold out arena, not everybody's always sitting down for every event. Somebody, it's a biological thing, I gotta go. <laughs> you get up and you leave your seat. So even with the, the peak of action, there's gonna be empty seats. And when uh, when they would do a poster for somebody like Hulk Hogan, it would be attention to tremendous detail to make sure the hair was right, make sure everything was right, and to make sure that when you looked at it visually, you didn't see anything. <clears throat> for the TV, how would Vince cordon off that? Would he do it with light? Because I know for the for the TV tapings, when they moved to the arenas, they, they were doing it in Poughkeepsie every week before, and then before that, Allentown. But then when they went to various arenas throughout the country, they, they kind of used pools of light in the crowd, they lit the crowd for, for the first time. Would he do that? Would he darken out the, 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 the areas where there were no seats? Or when you said yes, that, you and they would know ahead of time pretty well by advanced seats where the weak pockets were, and then they would they would set, concentrate areas so that you didn't have people spread out. And then the, I mean, there would be always be some of it. But there's always the nightmare of somebody going up there and say, we want to move you 10 people over here. Now that whole section is empty. Yeah. Um, huh. There was some of that. But, yeah. but they would concentrate on, on pockets. And they would do lighting in the, in the afternoon where they would have somebody up there on the, uh, uh, the scaffolding, yeah. on the catwalk, <clears throat> moving, moving spots, like you said, uh, where even once they did that, they still had the, uh, the flexibility of, of not using it. Right. They'd light an area, or they would dim it, or, or not use it. And uh, so I assume, after all that legwork was put in, the uh, 
or a building would pre-qualify for being good, you'd use that building again. It would be kind of put in a rotation. Just, just, you wouldn't have to look for new buildings. Yes, and the blueprint would basically work, work again. And the luxury when business is good is the problem takes care of itself because the, the seats would sell and, right. and you'd have all the people. Right. It's when, uh, and wrestling has always been cyclical to a degree. Mm -hmm. You have a period of time where it's not and then you, you adjust so that your television product doesn't uh, suffer for that. And in those downturns, if you had a dead crowd, volume-wise, would post sweeten it? Absolutely. My, when I first went there in, uh, in 1989, I had followed the television product. And so I had a, a kind of a preconceived idea of what I was walking into, what I, what I, would, what I would expect. And the two things that, that really, really surprised me, I go so far as to say shocked me, was that the audience were preconditioned to the individual entrance music, and usually within two or three notes, they knew who it was before they saw them, before there was anything else visual to hint who it was, and they would explode. And it almost like the highlight of, of, the, of any particular match was the entrance. Mm -hmm. And the bell would ring, and it was shocking sometimes you could hear a pin drop. And when you would watch the final product that went to air, um, they had people that were very adept at, at, at sweetening. Yeah, that's tremendous. Um, the production meeting concept I had never heard discussed uh, before your book. Um, what is it? Who was there? What was discussed? When was it? Was it the day of the event? Was it before? It was the day of, and usually in the morning of, uh, after everybody arrived, and they would try to get people there the night before, depending on the distance uh, traveled. And I go back again to my roots with the, with the NWA. The kayfabe philosophy uh, was such that people who were making decisions with what they picked up on cameras and, and the things that they did were often left in the dark and maybe somebody might sit in there and try to tease them to, you know, make sure you get a camera over here and oh, and kind of like right at the last second get